Greetings and welcome to the Golf Betting System Podcast 119. We are discussing the Travellers Championship on the PGA Tour. This podcast is for listeners of 18 and above. Please be gamble aware. I'm Steve Bamford, PGA Tour Preview at Golf Betting System. And with me, we have Golf Betting System's European Tour expert, Paul Williams, and podcast pundit, Barry O'Hanrahan. Good morning, gentlemen. Morning, chaps. Morning, guys. Visit Golf Betting System with betting previews containing tips, masses of tournament statistics and our predictor model, all available completely free of charge. Please subscribe to the pod to this podcast and drive the popularity of the show. As we said last week, we are now available to listen on Deezer. We are available on social media, on Twitter. Paul is at Golf Betting. I'm at Bamford Golf. Barry is at a good talk golf. You can join our golf betting system Facebook group. The link is available in the description box. We are up to over 5,200 members. Please look out for the Steve Bamford Golf YouTube channel where I present the golf betting show every week. And now I'm just going to say the usual spiel about reviews. We like reviews, don't we, gentlemen? We love Apple Absolutely, podcast yeah. reviews. And I must say... The, uh, the listeners out there have been extremely generous with their reviews recently, so thank you to each and every one of you. I always read them out at the start of every pod, and uh, I've got one here, which you're going to love, Paul. Absolutely okay. love this this review. So just keep them coming, chaps. It just really helps on Apple Podcasts. It just gives us visibility. It helps... Last week, we were back again in the top 10 of golf podcasts over here in the United Kingdom and Ireland. So um, your reviews really do help with visibility. Right, this one, Paul, you're going to love this. Matt Every is is the title. They've given us five stars. Not after last week. (laughs) It's from Danny Arch in the UK. Brilliant listen. I have listened to the last five episodes and had a return on three. However, could be better. As my old school teacher said, doesn't seem to listen properly and only processes what he thinks he's heard. I.e., I placed Matt Every on an each way bet and not on first round leader. Note note to self, must listen properly. (laughs) Great show, guys. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? You listen to the pod. You're you're saying about uh, Matt Every, and you you bang your you bang your two pound each way on Matt Every, and he comes in first round leader, and you you re, you, you listen again, you go, oh my god, he said it was first round leader bet. You'd never tip Matt Every up each way, would you? That'd be that'd be sheer folly. Well, I don't know. He's, he's got the job done in the past a couple of times, hasn't he? But yeah, he, he is a first. Oh, come he's a, on. He's be a first on. round leader horse, isn't he? Is I mean, last be last be week he missed. He he misses the cut last week. You, you know, he might become first round leader this week. Who knows? When he's good, he's very round. very good, isn't he? But it's usually just for a round or maybe two, and it, it's been a while now since he's managed well, to stick four rounds together. You guys were watching uh, Shot Tracker immediately at the start of last week, weren't you? And you said it was it was it something like an. Uh, you can tell within the first on the first green if he's going to have a great day. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it didn't start, it didn't start that bad. Yes, I think he made about a six foot on the first, didn't he, for par, and then uh, before the wheels came off on about the fourth or fifth hole. But uh, yeah, it, it, I think with, with a bet like that, you have just got to take a number of successive failures before you get rewarded in spades. And there are a number of players like that, aren't there, who who just pop up every now and again. From an outright perspective, someone like. Um, Ted Potter Jr., you could back him blindly and um, he'll continue to let you down until one week he wins at 500 to 1 and you get all of your stakes back and plenty more when he uh, when he obliges. There's a few players who just know how to either get first round lead or actually win a tournament when they get that, presented with that opportunity. But yeah, that's, so, that's, that's a yeah. shame about your bets um, uh, on, uh, on, Danny. on Danny on the... Uh, Every but uh, yeah, continue to listen. Hopefully, we can come up with a few nuggets over the uh, forthcoming future for you. And thanks for the review, very much. Yeah, thanks for the review, Danny. Much appreciate. Keep them coming. Um, I've got. We'll talk about last week, I, although I don't really want to. Um, uh, first thing, to say an apology to our YouTube podcast listeners because for some reason the link from our hosting package into YouTube didn't work. So uh, that's probably three to 400 listeners that 
probably were going, where the hell's the podcast this week? But anyway, you can, of course, download it on uh, on all the standard uh, podcast channels. But uh, apologies for that. Uh, you, uh, you, the link between uh, up to YouTube didn't work very well. So, RBC Heritage last week. Um, I got a complete blank, which is uh, standard for me at the RBC Heritage. I don't think I've ever had the winner there. Um, the fact that the winner was Webb Simpson adds a little bit of oil to troubled waters, really, because I tipped him up the week before, missed the cut. Um, but, you know, we live and learn, don't we? At the and end of the day. You well, Webb, you, yeah, you just, you just look. Webb Simpson is the perfect player for that golf course, isn't he? And you can just, he was phenomenal. You can just tell that looking at you know the correlating course one. And we were saying last week, weren't we, Paul? Sedgefield Country Club, huge, huge correlation. And he he finishes runner up at Sedgefield each and every year. Webb, doesn't he? He's got a great record there. His putter was just outstanding. And in that back yeah. nine, Barry, he was um, he was yeah. really, really very good, wasn't he? It was interesting to see just a little bit before that he had about I'd say three half decent looks in a row from that kind of mid range. And they were what you'd consider a wild miss for a pro, like, and he was missing left and right. Mm-hmm. So, and the commentator said, "Oh God, the you know putter doesn't seem locked in." And you know, the fair comment at the time. And all of a sudden, he just said, "Okay, I'm taking this tournament and I'm making it mine." And every putt looked automatic. And he was as much as he's not my favorite golf in the world because um, he just went and won a tournament back in Olympic uh, in. Uh, 2012 beating Harrington, yeah. even though Harrington beat himself, I still blame Webb Simpson for it. Um, I don't know. I've never given Webb the credit, but like his his CV just keeps getting better and better, and he's uh, he's a serious uh, closer. That was so impressive. I mean, there was what thirty odd guys within three shots. Oh, and was you, packed, wasn't it? You're thinking we could have a four or five way playoff here, mm-hmm. and yeah, it just slammed the door shut. Uh, even still, you know, there was it was exciting because there was a few guys with a chance to to kind of catch the number, but uh, it was a great watch. Didn't they do well to uh, get the get the tournament in, given the time scale that they had? Amazing how quick they can play, isn't it? When uh, when needs must. Yeah, and it didn't affect the scores whatsoever. Uh, the guys in the Shotgun Star podcast were saying that as well. Like scoring on Sunday was brilliant. They were all playing at a pretty zippy pace and uh, you know th- I guess that they didn't want to come back on the Monday when, um, when they pulled the tournament was there actual rain did did, did the course accept there was there was rain actually fell on the course yeah in that in that actually, in that in that um, interval for bad weather I actually wasn't watching at that stage so I'm not really sure I think I uh, think so because I read something to say that Simpson he found it, he was leaving a couple of putts short because the, the greens were a bit softer after mm-hmm. the, the delay so there must have been rain on the course it's interesting though you listen to this top five in the world McElroy, Rahm Justin Thomas Brooks Kepka, all absolute beasts off the tee and then Webb Simpson now up to five yeah yeah for a man of seven, for a man of his yeah. abilities off the tee, you know that just shows you how strong the rest of that guy's game is to be in the top five in the world, and he's banging it two ninety off the tee. This is putting. I mean, you, you talked about his putting on the back nine, Barry, but earlier in the week, everything inside twenty feet was just you know it, it was virtually a gimme. He, he just making nearly every putt that was within that kind of bracket. It's uh, outstanding performance with his flat stick in, in recent times. Particularly, you know, as, as it's been well documented, he had to go from the, the, the long putter to the uh, to the regular putter, didn't he? Do you think he could pull a major off this year? I mean, he's playing so well. <sighs> yeah, it's still it's still limited in terms of length, isn't he? There's still going to be tracks that are going to suit him far, far better. We were talking about wing foot just before we came on uh, on air, weren't we? And that. Kind of strike you as being um, a, a bit too long for someone like Webb. Would you say it was Steve seven seven thousand? It's gonna it's gonna it's gonna play yeah it's gonna play seven four fifty par seventy. It's a par seventy, which is mighty long, isn't it for for a player like? Webb I think since. I think a lot of people will mention him in terms of Harding Park for the PGA. Mm. Yeah, because clearly, and this is this is fact, Harding Park is literally next door to the Olympic Club where he won the U.S. Mm. Open. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, there's, you know, there's a wall separating them. They're, they're pretty much joined. So, my only concern with Harding Park would be 
is the percentage of Poana that's crept into the greens. Because they were pure bent when they played there in uh, the match play in 2015, was it? Uh, as, we, yeah. as we know, Poa will start to jump yeah. onto those greens. Yeah, unless they reload, yeah. And if there's a, if there's a percentage of West Coast Poana in those greens, that to me is a negative on Simpson. Mm-hmm. He struggles on Poana big style. Yeah. Um, I'm, do- I'm just trying to f- I'm trying to find out as we're talking what the length of the course is going to be. That's going to be a seven thousand two hundred and thirty four yard par seventy, which does feel very much in Webb's wheelhouse. But it's a bit closer, isn't it? Yeah, it's still yeah. going to play relatively long. The PJs do tend to be that kind of style, don't they? But and they're often seventy twos, aren't they? So it's a bit of a bit of a departure for for a PJ. It is, yeah, it is. It feels a bit more Oak Hill like back in mm. twenty thirteen when Duffner won. Yeah. And that's the only real PGA Championship in modern, you know, since 2010, where a non-bomber has won. So Steve, it could be that. Steve, I'm going to phrase this as a question for the listeners, but it's actually for me as well. Okay. Who, give us a few of the top Poana putters then. Just, you know, a little side information to keep in the memory banks. Well, the, the ultimate a Poana putter is, is your man DJ, isn't it? Mm. A lot of the West Coast performers, as, as you just kind of yeah. alluded to, Steve, so those guys that do play well, the likes of um, Pebble and Torrey Pines. And, and this week, actually, this, this week's a good example. Um, Riviera as well is another, another one with a bit, bit of Poana in the greens as well, isn't it? So players who tend to come to the fore. And it, particularly with this event, um, it's, uh, the, the travellers at River Highlands and also uh, Riviera, you do tend to get a lot of the same kind of players, or the same players, performing in multiple years. So I think there is some good, strong correlation with, with those Poana positive players and uh, the, the tracks that they perform on. Now they also say, and I heard Paul Tesori say this on a, uh, on a podcast, Matt Wiley's Golflandia podcast, because I, I actually put a question in about um, Poana, and he mentioned the fact that even the Poana is different. The the, the Poana on the west coast is far more grainy than the uh, on the west, than the Poana that they get on the east coast. So it's all these tiny, intricate details that you can find out about this stuff. And clearly, the pros and the caddies know all of it. Um, top. So if I, I'm, I'm just looking at the predictor variables, um, Barry. Uh, I'm looking at the the, the, the core um, database here. Dustin Johnson, over the last five years, is by far the most successful player on pure Poana. Then you've got Jason Day and John Rahm tied in second. Rory McIlroy third, which I'm actually surprised by, but he won a Poana um, tournament, didn't he, last year in Canada. That Those were pure Poana greens. Then you've got the likes of Patrick Reed, Justin Rose, Gary Woodland, of course. Branch Schnedeker, Jordan Spieth, Brooks Kepka, and Phil Mickelson, with uh, with the podcast favourite Paul Casey in uh, the next spot. Mm. Mark Leishman's another, isn't it? He loves Torrey Pines. Yeah. So yeah, even someone like the Shane Lowry's okay on Poana. Graham McDowell. Well, a few of the well, a lot of the Europeans will get far more exposure to it on the mm. on European tour circuit as well. So. Um, that should play into their hands to a certain degree as well. I thought. But we're we're not we're not talking pure Poana. We won't be talking pure Poana greens no. at Harding Park. We'll be talking a mix, and t- to find out the information is tough. Um, we we're actually talking to someone in the Facebook group this week, weren't we? Who's actually um, was a member there, and he's and he's a member of his family p- plays the course regularly, and he was talking about the fact that they when he used to play there, they were pure bent. But it's whether this Poana has actually crept into the greens. If, clearly, from a punting perspective, it'd be really good if we could find out prior to the uh, PGA. But that's uh, well, that's something we'll have to do some work. I mean, if you're a listener and you know the answer, guys, I'm sure that we've potentially got some California listeners out there. And you know if there is Poana in the greens at Harding Park, we'd absolutely love to know. Because theoretically, clearly, Simpson winning next door on a short par 70, you know, that's right in his wheelhouse, isn't it? Mm. But if we're finding out that the greens contain 50% Poana, mm, I'm starting to get red signals. Yeah, yeah. It starts to swing in the pendulum a bit the other yeah. way, doesn't it? What price would he be for the PGA Championship now? He says desperately, trying to find out. Yeah, I don't know. Is it going to be probably 40s or 50s, I'd have thought. I can't imagine it would be 
massively shorter than that. But, but he's the he's top five in the world. He's number one in the Sagarin rankings. Why would he be forty or fifty? Just think because he's unpopular with the punters. Well, he, he's been you as you would expect. He's been massively shortened since the win. But I'm seeing thirty three to one about him. Even even a one firm at Betfred at thirty fives. Yeah. So when you get closer to the day, you know, unless he's won the week before, a couple of weeks before, you probably find that he's pushed out to that kind of crazy thing. thing, Barry. Listen to this: Ricky Fowler is shorter than Webb Simpson in the betting for the PGA That's Championship. That's absurd. <laughs> yeah. Adam Scott, he's another one that you could think for somewhere like that, couldn't you? Because he won at Riviera, didn't he? He doesn't mind Poana, Adam Scott. Mm. I don't really know why we're talking about the PGA Championship on the basis that it's <laughs> in August and we're still in the end of June. But yeah, it's not got far no away now, is it? No, not no, no. Too far closer. away. Getting closer. It will be so fast it'll come upon us. I hope, well, yeah. <laughs> if you if you were summarising, gentlemen, the performances of the betting leaders this week from what you saw last week, how would you summarise those individuals? So JT, Rory, Bryson, John Rahm, Kepka and Dustin. Well, what would you say about what would you say about those guys? Because they're heading the betting again this week. They, are, they would. Yeah, yeah. Rory's Raw, not quite right for me at the moment. JT's clearly showing some improved form. Um, mm-hmm. I think I'd make Bryson favourite for the tournament if I were chalking this up personally. Yeah, Kepka was brilliant. Looks like he was yes. properly kind of back, back in it and feeling it, you know, and. Hitting some, uh, hitting some great shots, and uh, yeah, gotta give him. He's he's a bit of credit for his Twitter game. If it's him or somebody in his team, like it's good fun as well. Yeah, a little bit of a little bit of personality, you know, it's cool. So. Yeah, and he has been accused of um, being a bit uh, plastic in that yeah. respect before, hasn't he? Um, but yeah, for me, it's whether he focuses on events like the uh, like the Travelers, or it's just a case of him warming himself up for the uh, for the big ones further down the line. But yeah. Vastly improved, and that's been reflected by the uh, the chop in his price this week down to twenty to one. That that's the that I, is the point with Brooks, isn't it? And Paul's just absolutely banged it on the head. You know, the trouble with Brooks is he doesn't win domestic PGA Tour events, does he? He just wins. I mean, listen to this. So he won the Waste Management Phoenix Open in twenty fifteen. His his maiden victory. Then since then, U.S. Open, U.S. Open, PGA Championship, PGA Championship. WGC. There was a C, there was a CJ Cup thrown in there mm. back in October 2018. But the thing is, I don't know. He's been he's been in you know his game was falling apart. So you even a player like he must be thinking you know I need a victory. And the Travellers is a decent tournament, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah, decent tournament, decent field. You wonder when he'll kind of hit that psychological change that. You know, he's clearly got no problem getting himself mentally up for a big, big event. Mm. But there's going to be a point where he hits, where it just clicks in his head. And he's like, do you know what? Not quite saying, you know, to hell with it. But like, why not just go out and win this week? And he just gets that B in his bonnet and just does it. Um, you know, there's a few shots been going at him, you know, from the, the uh, like Brandel Chamley and Nick Faldo and, that could be the kind of thing he could just turn into a motivation to go and do it. Um, until such time as he does pick up a, let's say, a regulation event, I'll, I'll still be fading him, even at 20 to 1, which looks like quite a generous price um, versus, you know, what how he was playing last week. And knowing how good he can be, I still won't back him at that because you know, he doesn't have the... Uh, he hasn't shown the want to go and grab more titles or regular season events. So um, I think he's going to be, if he stays healthy now, he's going to be such a factor though in these uh, upcoming majors. Brooks and DJ are exactly the same kind of player. When they start driving the ball at their peak, that's when they start to really win golf tournaments, isn't it? And it was interesting with Kepka. He's number one for strokes gained off the tee last week. And Dustin Johnson was number two. <laughs> it was just T to Green. Kepka was sixteenth. Uh, so it, it's coming. It's, it's coming. Yeah. It, 
It's a mad he's a pro- with DJ. His it? approach play and, and around the green game were both. Well, his approach play was neutral. His around the green game was highly negative. But you know, at the end of the day, the the, the scrambling is is the least of your problems. That that will come. I mean, that's just work, isn't it? He putted very very well. He's he's been good with his putter the last two actually now. Mm. Both top fifteen for strokes gained putting. So Kepka's definitely rounding to the task. Undoubtedly. Yeah. And those those stats for DJ would he lead total driving, ball striking, and the all round yeah. categories last week. So that's a yeah. that's a big positive in from his, from his perspective as well. And he likes a bit of power, as we just said. What are you guys thinking? How are you enjoying the fanless events? I know you don't watch that much golf. You just look at the numbers, <laughs> you place your bets, and just watch the watch the numbers move on the screen. Um, but. I don't, I, I don't, I, do you know what? I've barely noticed the difference. So it isn't a negative for me at all. In fact, I just love the fact that you can hear what the players are saying. I mean, mm-hmm. I was saying to Paul earlier that they, they had on Featured Group Sunday very early on, they had Wesley Bryan and Bubba Watson. And listening to them, the chat was just, it was just great. Just completely, you could hear every word they were saying, just winding each other up the whole way around. Yeah. And I like yeah. that. I can't stand the football without a crowd. That's just completely. I can't watch it, but the golf makes no difference to me. Yeah, I really, yeah. I quite enjoy. And actually, I like the fact that the ground's being played quicker. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no crowds to deal with, and um, and the golf you know, courses, not- the golf courses are pure, aren't they? Because we haven't got yeah. the, we haven't got all of these stands and hospitality uh, units in the way, and the, and the the rough isn't being trampled down. So I, I much prefer it. I think that could be why partly. If- or tied favorite thing about why the, you know with the no crowds uh, you can hear the, you can hear the interactions really well between the players conversations we'd never ordinarily hear but being the golf course gets to be presented in its pure form and it brings what these guys are doing on the tour one step closer to what we do as amateurs and just go and play a golf course yeah. so it's a it's a closer comparison even though it's still a million miles away the game they play from the game we play but they're playing the golf course as is and uh you know no crowds no trampling no grandstanding it's uh it's good and you know and as the guys uh, on the shotgun start were saying you get the drones up there as well so you get these really cool different style of visuals of the golf course that we'd, we'd never get to see or otherwise which is um which is a treat yep no no i, I think i agree with all of that really it's um it's not been that much different. I mean, talking about football, Steve, I, I flicked between watching a, a game with no canned crowd noise and then the uh, the, <laughs> the fake crowd noise. And I had to watch it with the fake crowd noise because without it, it just felt absolutely soulless. But watching golf, no, I, th- I, 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 I don't notice a massive amount of difference. Absolutely. Um. Should we, should we start talking about the travellers? Oh, one thing I must say, one thing I have to say. Well, there's a couple of things I'm going to point out actually. Um, I, if you look, if you're looking at the top of the leader, uh, the betting board this week, the one player that I think is struggling right now, and I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's all to do with this world number one situation, is John Rahm. Because John keeps getting slow starts in tournaments and. The fact that he knows it keep you know it's out there isn't it? Oh, well if he wins this tournament and Rory finishes outside the top three, John Rahm will be world number one. I just think it's nagging away at him because actually if you look at John Rahm and you look at where he plays his best golf, John Rahm and the Travellers are like a it's like a it's a it's a real um, relationship made in heaven. It's a, what they say a marriage Match. made in heaven, yeah. Match made in heaven. Yeah. But he, I think that's I think that's weighing down on him. The other thing I want to just quickly mention, I thought la- the last two weeks were big, big weeks for Jordan Spieth. Was he was he going to come out of um, the COVID uh, cancel uh, delay, you know, playing better golf? And there were signs, weren't there? There were signs at both tournaments, actually, that things are coming around slowly. But... Mm. It, once he got into a half decent position last week, bearing in mind I was on him, he just absolutely collapsed from Friday onwards. Yeah. Awful, awful golf. Strange, what is yeah. it with you? I, I think a lot of it's mental rather than just rather than just swing. What do you, what are your thoughts on it? 
I mean, it's, we, what can we see from afar? Because clearly he's worked on his swing and he's, he's in a Ricky Fowler type place, isn't he? Where he's changed the swing and he's trying to bed it in and, you know, it, it works for nine holes. And then all of a sudden you find that Jordan's 40 yards left, you know, mm. uh, He's got so many destructive drives in him at the moment, Jordan Spieth. It's incredible. That's the problem, though. He's trying to build confidence in the new things he's implementing. And as you know, as many shots as it takes to build that confidence, it only takes one bad one to really knock you back several steps or really destroy you for an extended period of time. So, you know, I guess the more of these stretches of holes he puts together, 9, 12, a whole round, 27 holes, the more of these stretches he puts together without any of those destructive shots that cause those negative thoughts, the better for him. And, mm-hmm. You know, he'll be building towards that tournament where he puts all four rounds together. Might not be good enough to win, but I think that could be, you know, a big step in, you know, to, to a new level that it makes it harder for a bad shot or two to knock him down. And uh, I think that I think he'll slowly build. I hope he does because he's just fantastic to have in the mix in tournaments because you just has that excitement factor. You just don't quite know what's going to happen. Um, it's not like watching Webb Simpson play, which is quite metronomic. You know, there's always a little bit of crazy going on with speed, and that makes it really interesting as a viewer. So hoping he continues to trend in the right way. Mm. Yeah, he can, he, he, he can nail. A, a big part or a number of big parts or a number of successive parts, can't he? And uh, what was interesting at Colonial was for the first two rounds in particular, his ball striking was outstanding. Yeah, outstanding. it was clean. It was, it, it was clean, wasn't it? He was hitting fairways. He was hitting greens in reg. Yeah. And, and then just, it just uh, yeah. it's that fell away with the pressure. I think, you know, Barry's yeah. probably hit the nail on the head there. It's, it, you, you can be absolutely jam-packed full of confidence until such point as something just knocks that and then... Um, if that starts to put negativity into your mindset, then um, you can start on a negative spiral down. Which um, you know, and the world's best players, or the players who are playing the best golf at any particular point, are the ones who can bounce back quickly from a bad swing or a bad hole or a bad break or bad putt or whatever it may be, and uh, and get get straight back into it in the next hole. It will come. It will come with Jordan, I'm sure. It's taking its time, though, isn't it? It's mm. been a long, long time that we haven't seen him in the mix. Yeah. But and and the other thing, of course, is that modern day golf, and that's why Webb Simpson's top five in the world position is even more outstanding, is because you know the likes of Bryce and DeChambeau are taking it to new heights in terms of power and distance, mm. and that's going away from the likes of a Jordan Spieth, isn't it? Yep. So. Yeah. It's it's an interesting scenario with Spieth, I think. Um, I'd like to see him getting back towards the top of leaderboards. I, 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 I'm, I'm with Barry. He's, he's a different kind of player, and it's, it's something different to put into the mix. Yeah. Right, let's talk travellers. TPC River Highlands, Cromwell, Connecticut. Um, for those of you in the UK and Ireland that aren't uh, United States experts, Connecticut in the northeast of... The United States. So we've started in Texas at Colonial. Last week we we're in South Carolina, and we're now actually northeast of New York. We're between New York and Boston in Connecticut, uh, and we're seeing a, a different golf course in terms of its agronomy. Um, it's a Robert J. Moss designed golf course in 1928, but it had a Pete Dye serious renovation in '84, so it's classified as a Pete Dye golf course. Um, it's a short golf course. It's a par 70. It only, um, um, the distance is 6,841 yards. It's um, a Parkland golf course, so tree line golf, uh, golf course. But uh, plenty of water hazards, especially um, I think it's 15, 16, 17, all played around a lake. Uh, lots of pressure drives in that position and also. Um, pressure approach play over water the greens uh, they are a mix of bent grass and poana scoring here tends to be mid track so we, we tend to let's see ranks here uh, mid 20s out of 50 courses a year so it's scorable but it isn't super super resort level golf uh, usually 
it tends to be that typical mid score. If you're anywhere around that 16, 17 under mark, you can be very, very close. The I did mention last week, didn't I, meant Paul, that there had been a lot of rain in the build up to the RBC, and that golf course just played played soft from yeah. Thursday onwards. There was no run on the fairways at all Thursday, Friday, and then it, the fairways just dry. But because again it was nice and sunny, they were just watering the greens anyway. Um, so that's why you saw such low scoring. And and the players were saying, you know, we're not used to twenty two under around here. It's normally say twelve, thirteen under yeah, yeah, somewhere yeah. like a like a um, a harbour town. One point here that I did think was interesting. If we're comparing uh, fairway widths, last week at 300 yards, 22 yards wide at Harbour Town. This week at 300 yards, it's 29 yards. So actually, this kind of golf course with those seven, eight extra yard uh, yards per hole of width does mean that power hitters... For me, Harbour Town is the most anti-Rory McIlroy course you will ever find. And he actually said, apparently last week that he was never ever going to return there because <laughs> <laughs> it just it, it harnesses everything about him and I said to you Paul in the pod if if DeChambeau can win at Harbour Town based upon his new regime it would it would be a it would be amazing and he actually played the golf course very similarly to how he did back uh, in you know 2015 I think it was when he finished fourth because he had no choice you no, just no. cannot you've got to rain it in a bit, haven't you? you have to rein it in around here though um, the likes of a Bubba Watson, you can you can be hitting it three ten, three three fifteen off a lot of the tees here. I personally always rank TPC River Highlands close to somewhere like a Muirfield Village. It really is a ball striking test, so it doesn't really matter about your length off the tee here. But you, if you if you're the salt that can be hitting metronomic greens in regulation and hitting the ball close. Uh, and then converting a lot of those birdie chances, you know, you're in with a real chance this week. Yeah, but as you, as you said, given the, um, the width of the fairways, it can lend itself um, more. Yeah, it doesn't to, it doesn't to matter, Paul? If you it doesn't matter if you Chesery. I mean, it says everything, doesn't it? Last two winners here, Chesery, Evie, Bubba Watson. I mean, yeah. they're just poles apart, aren't they? Mm-hmm. But what they both did was hit tons and tons of regulation hit, uh, greens in reg, and also hit the ball close. Yeah. So you know. If you're a bomber and gouger, it makes no difference. If you're a Ches Reeve or a, a Russell Knox, you're on a level footing around this golf course. That kind of comes out in the stats when you look at the, um, you know, we look at the stats of what players have done the uh, past champions to win here. Uh, the one stat that jumps out from the traditional statistics, you know, driving distance, it averages out 30th across the last 10 winners. Accuracy thirty second, greens and reg twenty seventh. Those aren't those aren't big numbers. The number that jumps out though, just just one number, putting average seventh. So of the last ten winners, uh, they've averaged seventh per putts per GIR on the greens the week that they've won. And then you look at that from a strokes gained perspective, you get a little bit more detail around it. So strokes gained last four winners: Reevy, Watson, Spieth, and Knox. Strokes gained off the tee twenty second. Not important. Strokes gained approach, 7th. Very important. Strokes gained around the green, 20th. Strokes gained tee to green, 2nd. That's pretty mad, isn't it? So, you you know, uh, Ches Reevy was 1st tee to green. Bubba Watson was 2nd tee to green. Jordan Spieth was 1st tee to green. Russell Knox was 5th tee to green. The, year, the years that they've won it. Strokes gained putting. So, putting average averages out of 7th. But strokes gained putting, 20th. So, that says to me... Great approach play, creating you know short to mid distance conversion opportunities, and holding lots of those opportunities. It isn't about feet of putts. No, no. And that's that's the game. Yeah, and you just look at players that play well around here. You know the likes of Bubba, the likes of Paul Casey, who's got the scoring average. He's scoring average number one around here. What do those individuals do? They, you know, they they just they, they hit. Plenty of greens, don't they? And they create lots of chances. They're not the best putters either, are they? No, but I, from the sounds of it, it's, it's as much about proximity as it is about yeah. um, you know the rest of your game. So if you are hitting it into you know five, ten feet and you know, quite regularly and, and making a fair share of them, then that's going to be good enough as opposed to nailing thirty or forty footers every you know four or five hours. 
I, I remember watching Bubba 2018 when he won for us at 33-1. to 1, And it isn't so much even the proximity. to it. He just knows where he needs to be getting that ball to then have the best birdie opportunity. Because yeah. sometimes you're far better being, say, below the hole or above the hole and 20 foot away than having a, a shorter putt that's, say, downhill or across, across the green, across a contour, that kind of thing. It's yeah. just knowing where to position that ball. Yeah, he's clearly very, very comfortable on this track, isn't he? As he's with a few tracks dotted around the uh, around the circuit. Um, I looked at previous winners here and what they'd kind of been doing in the lead up, and I and I genuinely look. I, I want to see players that have been. I mean, it's fairly obvious. <laughs> I want to see players that have been have been hitting their approaches really well of late. Yeah, you know, because you could see that across Knox in twenty sixteen. You could see it across Spee. He'd been finished in the top 10, both at Memorial and Colonial, before he won this at 10-1 to 1 in 2017. Mm. Um, Bubba's just Bubba. He'd actually driven the ball really, really nicely at Muirfield Village. I think that's Bubba's go-to, really. If you see excellent strokes gained off the tee for Bubba, he's similar again, of course, to Kopka and um, to Dustin Johnson, who we were talking about at the top. Um, if you're seeing these guys driving the ball really well, they're a danger. And Bubba has been driving the ball nicely of late. Um, and Reevy, I mean, you you tipped him up for that amazing third place at the US Open. He then flew across from California to here last year. He was a 70-1 to one shot. Bear in mind, he hadn't won for over 12 years on the main tour. Mm. Um, and he just carried on, didn't he? Just yeah. metronomic, fairways, greens, made some putts. Yeah, and he did putt well, didn't he? And that that, that was the, the key with Chess because he can, he can putt, but he can putt um, pretty averagely um, most weeks. But uh, yeah, he clearly took that form that he'd found at the uh, the US Open and uh, and converted the week after. And the way, I don't think there were that many people on him. But, you know, I, I remember um, the week of that event, and you know, despite what we'd seen the week before from him, it was. Uh, <sighs> It, it, well, no, you had a, you had the typical talk, didn't you? Well, I'm not going to back Ches Reevy at seventy to one when he was two hundred and fifty to one last week. All the value's gone. So, okay, well, you miss out on a seventy-one winner then, didn't you? Yeah. And it, it, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of that going on with Abraham Answer this week, isn't there? It's like, well, I'm not backing Abraham Answer at thirty-five to one. He's a rubbish price. Well, I've actually tipped him up. So there's 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 the first one. I've gone one and a half points each way on Abraham Answer at thirty-five to one. Because if he does exactly the same as he did last week, which is what we saw last year with Ches Reevy, um, Answer's just got to be in the mix, in my opinion, because his game's perfect for Randy. He's just metronomic, ball striker, tee to green. Mm. And he his, his strokes gain... I mean, you watched it, Barry, in the final round. His tee to green game was absolutely phenomenal last week. Um, he was yeah. fir- first for strokes gained... Uh, sorry, he was second for strokes to gain tee to green behind Sergio Garcia who must be on a lot of people's radars this week. And on approach last week, you had Abraham Anser first, Sergio Garcia second, and Joking Neiman in fourth spot. So there's there's three individuals who are playing some fantastic approach play right now. Bryson DeChambeau was seventh, Webb Simpson was eighth. Personally, if I was going to take one of the shorties, I would be taking DeChambeau. That's how I feel about it. The way I worked it through for me, DeChambeau was very interesting. I think Dustin Johnson at twenty-eight to one is very, very interesting. Whether he's far, whether he is as far down the path as he needs to be to win at twenty-eight to one, um, I'm not hundred percent certain, but he's certainly improving, and he's got ten, yes, ten wins on Poana or bent grass Poana mix greens which is by far and away the most in this field. Yeah, it does respond on it, doesn't it? Yeah. I, personally, I, I would take a Dustin over a Brooks Kepka this one. Mm. So I'm in with answer. I mean, it doesn't need any real um, explanation. The thing that I did find interesting with him um, from last year was he was the first round leader. Uh, he then played rubbish for 36 holes and then he finished like a train shooting seven under 63, the best of the day on Sunday to finish eighth. And he said at the time, it's, he, he thinks it's a great golf course. It's perfect for him. 
Um, it's all about shot making and 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 basically attacking golf with your approaches. So you still, just, are you still a maiden on the PGA Tour? I know you won over in uh, I forget who it was now. It's one of the European Tour events, was it? He won, yeah. Aust- he won in Australia, didn't he? The, right. the, he won the Australian Open, which he would have won on um, bent grass greens. I've always had answer as a bent grass green positive player, mm. and I don't like him on Bermuda. But this year, he's finished second at the American Express, which was on Bermuda greens, a Pete Dye design. He's finished second at the Heritage last week on Bermuda grass greens, which is a Pete Dye design. He's now going to a Pete Dye design which is more up his street in terms of bent grass and Poana mix. So, yes, he's short, of course, 35 to 1. But he's a very, very good golfer these days. Don't forget, second at the Northern Trust in a major tight field last August, finished fourth at the WGC HSBC Champions, and already this year he's finished second, sixth, twelfth, seventh, fourteenth and second. You know, if there's if there's a player that's on the march for their first maiden tour victory, it's um it's Abraham Answer. And actually, he didn't crack, did he? On Sunday, he was six birdies, no bogeys. Um, it was just that Webb went absolutely mad on the yeah, back nine, just holding everything, wasn't he? I don't think it was Answer threw it away. It was just that he was beaten by Webb. Webb was the better player on the day. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. No, Answer was brilliant on Sunday, and just you just have to feel sorry for him because. He did nothing wrong. He just got beaten. So all he can do is tip the cap and tee it up again this week and see what he can do. So you see what he can do. If he plays anywhere of the same ilk, I think he'll be in the mix. So I'm on answer. Right. Let's throw it over to you two guys. Um, who are you backing or who have you considered and who have you eventually uh, plumped for? Start with. Let's start with Paul. At the top end, um, the and I don't particularly like backing players at, right at the top of the market, but I just have this sneaky feeling that this will be the week that Bryson mm. um, really attacks. This will be the week that he puts it all together. The last two weeks haven't overly um, suited him, yet he's finished third at Colonial, um, eighth last week at uh, Harbour Town. And they're both a bit tight. And we, we know, as we've just discussed, that this track is one that can... Um, be a little bit more susceptible to the longer hitters, to the more aggressive players, and I think that he will um, take that on board. And um, I, I've just got this sneaky feeling he'll run away with it this week. Um, and I've just backed him out right, um, fourteen to one to win the yeah. tournament. Um, a lot of people have, yeah, yeah, no each way on that. I think he'll either win it or he'll just uh, he'll kind of plod around the eighth or tenth position again. I mean, you look at his form: last five events, fifth, second, fourth, third, eighth. He's clearly um, in some very, very strong form. We know all about his um, his body um, shaping that he's working through at the moment. And um, it's been interesting to watch that development. It's been fascinating to see how that's manifesting itself on the golf course. And he's playing some cracking stuff, isn't he? And if you go back to the start of that, um, that stretch that I've just talked about, he's 57 under par um, for those five events, which is the best on tour for that uh, period of time. 55.1 strokes gained total over, the, uh, over over that stretch since the 10th of February, which again leads the tour. It's some, some mightily impressive stats coming out of Bryce. I was listening to the Pat Mayo podcast this morning as I was cycling along my local river enjoying my morning ride. And they said that basically the last two weeks it's been his par five scoring that's been letting him down, which actually works this week because clearly there's only two par so, fives. So, yeah, yeah, yeah it's mm. about par four. So that, that's another positive, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you talked about greens and regulation as well as being a key stat. He's been third for the, the past two weeks at uh, Colonial and Harbour Town as well. Um, putting on these greens, second for putting average here on debut back in 2016. He was fifth for putting here last year as well. Progressive form on the track, 47th, 26th, 9th and 8th. Um, I just, I think if there's a player that should be um, worthy favourite for this tournament, it should be Bryson. And I think 14 to 1, he's worth covering off as a win-only bet. So yeah, I've, I've plumped for him at the top end of the market. Any shorties that you fancy, Barry? That's a compelling case. Yeah, and it's it, it it definitely sticks out in my head that last week is not the kind of place for 
his new no. approach to golf. Mm. No, no, no. no, no. Uh, so colonial, not... colonial was far more of a bomber's course, and it has been in the past. Heritage is the one course you cannot overpower on the PGA Tour each and every year. But here, no. Colonial, yes. And actually, but DeChambeau was eighth for approach across the whole field at Colonial, and he was seventh for approach last week. His approach play is fantastic right now. Mm. So yeah, I, yeah, I, I, can, I can see exactly where Paul's heading with that. Yeah, I, I think this is the week he kind of quote unquote un- unleashes the Kraken, and we'll just see him take on some absurd things. You know, yeah. trying to. So it, it should be uh, it'll be an entertaining sweat for your bet, Paul. Yeah, yeah I think uh, so, yeah. so. Let's hope you get a sweat. <laughs> the last two weeks, I've had no sweat at all. The only sweat I had was whether JT Poston could actually sneak a top seven place. He came very close for me. Yes. But yeah, I, I haven't had anyone in the mix last two weeks. It's been very frustrating. I no, just want someone. Been, been well, on Sunday, I'm thinking, oh, I might get a winner here. Get the old sweat going. Mm. Yeah. To, I, it was actually, to be honest, I, I have had nobody uh, even remotely close to playing in the tournament, but the way my bets have gone. But to be able to watch on Sunday with no um, bias either way was actually enjoyable because mm. there were like what 800 guys in contention and I had none of them so I was able to just enjoy the golf yeah you can just take the emotion out of it can't you yeah yeah so um, so your 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 positive DeChambeau Barry yes doesn't yeah, mean it, doesn't well, mean you're backing him but you're, you're put, you can see the reasoning behind that bet absolutely yeah yeah for sure um, he should be he should be shorter than, than Rory you know based on the last couple of weeks yeah. uh, maybe not overall but the last couple of weeks yeah so um, I, I have to think about. I think Rory is just tuning himself up. He's not too pushed about winning these. He's just kind of getting all the things in place and lined up, and he's going after majors. That's that's got to be where he is. He's 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 won his share of regulation PGA Tour events, blah blah blah. And I I think Rory's just revving up the engine and getting everything ready for the the big season. So, mm. <laughs> um, be excited, okay. isn't it? Can you imagine yeah. a major with him and Kepka and Dustin all at the top of the leaderboard? It's going to be fantastic viewing. That's a, that's a, and that don't forget, of course, he won that world match play at Harding Park, the first uh, yeah. major this year, back in 2015 at uh, for the PGA Championship. So he he must be revving the engine, looking forward to that course. I I think so. Yeah, I that's what it feels like. He's not. A, why kill himself now when there's bigger bigger things coming around the corner? So. Okay. Um, Look, you mentioned somebody there that I actually have backed uh, this week, um, JT Poston. Mm-hmm. He has a truly tragic record around this golf course, and it doesn't make any sense. I dug back into the previous uh, years and his form coming into it, and his form coming into this event has not been great. So that could be a little bit of a factor as to why he just missed the cut here three times in a row. But other than that, the rest of his game is in great shape. He's at two top tens the last two weeks. All aspects of the game are firing well. And for that, he was at reasonably good odds, which, what did I get him at? 66s, I think, maybe? Yeah, or, 66s yeah. are widely available, yeah. Yeah, so took a little punt on him, which was, uh, yeah, we'll see. I backed him last week. He didn't really let me down. I like Poston. I think he's a great player. Um, he's got wins in him, Poston, I think. Yeah, yeah. Still yeah. haven't quite worked out what... Clearly, he can play Carolina golf courses very well. That's clear. Um, can he play upstate? We'll we'll see. I mean, I, he, he could be one potentially f- for this week and next week when you should be seeing a weaker field in uh, Detroit. And I was saying to Paul, a lot of these elite players are disappoint- disappearing next week. It's what players from under that top elite level are going to pop up mm. that we need to be on. That's that's the thing. That's that's the mission for next week. Poston could be one of those. Um, I take it as well, Barry, because I know that you've backed him. And <laughs> um, I, I was left with the decision with the stake that I had left, whether I was going to go for yoking Neiman, the Wunderkind, or whether I was going to go for Victor Hovland. And do you know what I thought? Do you know, I'll go, I'll be a little bit different. I've never tipped up Victor in my life. So I've gone Victor and I know that you've gone for the Wunderkind. Yeah. What were your, what were your, what were your reasons around going for, uh, going for yoking? 
Well, well, look, between us, one of us has to break the duck about not having a sweat on Sunday night now that we've diversified away from each other. Mm. So this is this is a good thing. One of us will be happy and one of us will be sad on Sunday. Likely um, to be you, yes. Yeah. <laughs> the I, thing I, that I know? noticed about him is yoking Neiman on Bermuda grass, it's just alien to him. So for him to be in the mix last week, he's... And and we said, uh, didn't we? We said at Colonial, didn't we? There's going to be players that pop out when they go upstate. And he was one of them, yeah? Because he likes bent grass. He likes power. And sure enough, all of a sudden, um, he's starting to find his straps. So this course should suit. I mean, wasn't he top five here last year? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, he was. He was fifth here last yeah. year. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. 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 So, so it's... Uh, the thing that kind of just triggered her for me was just to see his, um, you know, his little post round interview. You could see in his face; he was just like, ah, oh, you know, so close. And he just he had that kind of uh, vibe about him. I was like, oh god, this guy's ready to go again. You know, he, he's like, he got so close. He's young, he's hungry, and arguably, you know, he's going to a course that he finished top uh, top five on last year. The game's in really good shape at the moment. His putting wasn't great last week, but you know, T to Green um, was superb. His uh, strokes game, T to Green, he was third last week. So, and and his approach game, he was fourth. So, yeah, he's in he's in decent shape. And uh, I thought uh, go back to back to hungry uh, the hungry young wolf. Yep. Here's a, here's a question. Here's a question for you two. Rank the following three players. Abraham Answer, Sung Jaim, and Yoking Nima. What, generally or for this week? Just generally. Who do you think of those three has got the ability to actually, you know, get in the mix in majors and that? M, Neiman, Answer. Well, ooh, M, Answer, Neiman for majors, but in general, M, Neiman, Answer. Yeah, I think I know Answer is the third out of the three as well. Um, it's an interesting, like, um, it's an impossible question, isn't it? Because you're going to have different... Very um, similar, aren't they? And that's... Yeah, you're going to have different courses and different tracks. I'd probably put him at the top of that. those three, personally. I think he's probably got... The if the percent. major's in Florida. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. they're all very... They're, they're, they're three very hyped players, aren't they? Mm. And they're all very talented, young individuals, aren't they? Yes. So, yeah, very, very similar, I think, those three. And they're literally all thirty to thirty-three to one this week. Ne- Neiman's been backed into thirty-three. So, glad I got on a bit earlier than that. What did you get on it? Um, did you get fifties? I think I got him at. Ooh, I think I got him at forties. Forties yeah. seconds. You can't argue with Neiman, can you? He was fourth, I think, for strokes gained approach last week. Yeah, he's got that classic combination of um, incoming form and course form, isn't he? Fifth and fifth, if you look at those two lines. and uh, He's mm-hmm. going to be extremely popular. This I've seen him tipped up a few places already, so he's going to be a, going to be a popular pick this week. I got early enough. I got in at 50s, which is, which is nice. Yeah. Nice price. Why, why did you go for Hovland? Um... I remember Victor when he popped up as that amateur and, and he played very well, didn't he, at that US Open at Pebble last year. And actually, if you look, and this is in my preview, um, we've been very slack this week. I haven't mentioned the top 10 of the predictor model. I haven't mentioned any of the content. Anyway, all of the content, chaps and ladies, is av- available in our description box. But in my preview, I mentioned that this golf course plays very well and links very well to the West Coast Poana stop-offs. Pebble being a really, really important one. Torrey Pines and Riviera as well. Um, And Hovland played so well at the US Open. And when you look at his numbers, this was another thing that was mentioned today on the Pat Mayo podcast. He said something about the last 36 rounds... Victor Hovland in this field is ranks number one for strokes gained ball striking. And that, that to me is this golf course. It's all about, you know, if you can metronomically find fairways and greens and create chances, as long as you're a medium putter and you're not mega, you know, you're not mega negative on the week, you can get up in the mix. Like that just to me shouts Victor Hovland. 
He's working with Pete Gout Cowan on his short game. And you haven't seen massive jumps in terms of strokes gained around the green for him. But when I checked Victor out, um, he was in the top 20, I think, for scrambling the last two weeks. So clearly, you know, the work that he's been putting in with Cowan, whether that's, you know, face-to-face... Uh, sorry, I got that wrong. He's, he's been 26th and 27th for scrambling the last two weeks. Um, some weeks we've seen him down in the 60s and the 70s because, as he admits, he can't. He struggles to chip. Um, I think so. That short game is potentially tightening him up. He's hitting tons and tons of greens, tons and tons of fairways. His strokes game numbers are fantastic at the moment. So I just thought that Hovland would suit around here. Bearing in mind as well, he's also got to the stage where now he's a year. He's been a professional for a year. He's actually starting to go back to courses for the second time, which again has to be an advantage because everything up until this point has been, he turns up at a golf course that he's never played before. So yeah, I just... Um, since the PJ Tour has resumed, 10th for strokes gained off the tee, 10th on approach, 6th for tee to green, and 11th for strokes gained total. Now, that 11th strokes gained total is effectively strokes gained current form. So he's 11th in this field, strokes gained current form, and he was out at 66 to 1. Um, I grabbed him at 60s with the eight places. So I just thought that was a good bet. Yeah, it's good. Um, yeah, I mean, we've, we've seen what Pete Cowan can do for uh, people's short games, so... Uh, it's the com- the comments about Victor's get- short game were funny. So it's he's a very likable player. And do you know what? Here, question about him: Do you think he could sneak on to the Ryder Cup team for Europe this uh, next ne- next yeah. year? Now, when when it mm. we see it looks very likely it'll be yeah, next year. Yeah, it does. Doesn't it? Yeah, potentially. I, I, if you're Padre Harrington and you want to get new blood into the team. Surely Victor, who is a PGA Tour regular, he's playing at the highest level week in, week out, has got to be one of those on your shortlist if he can get you get you can get him in. Mm. I'd love I'd love to see him in the Ryder Cup. I think he'd be I think he'd be great. Um, so yeah, and I think the extra year might work. To, it depends on how they freeze off the picks and everything. I think they'll probably keep the rankings rolling, or they should do yeah. because you know in a situation where you cut them off this time. You know, sometime in September, and then you have to wait a whole year because people can fall in and out of form. Yeah. I think, so I think the extra role, doesn't it, as you say, for the, for the entire yeah. period. And I think that extra year could work to his advantage in getting uh, maybe a couple of the older guard dropping off a little bit, and, and he's got a little extra time to, to, to make his stamp on, uh, on the game. Last week, Victor was second for total driving, fourth for ball striking. And he was sixth for all round, and he finished twenty first. Because again, you know, he missed too many putts. But he's in good nick, Victor Hovland. And I think, I think this this move to uh, Bent Power won't won't phase him in the slightest. So yeah, I thought, yeah, it was a toss up, Neiman or Hovland. I've gone for three kind of mid prices at the top. I thought I'd go for something a little bit deeper on the price, so we went Hovland. The other two I've included. <laughs> Three wins here. It's got to be Bubba Watson, hasn't it? So, I mean, with Bubba at 33s. If I had to put Bubba up, Paul would have shot me. Um, it's just an it's, auto bet, isn't it, as you said? It's an auto call. bet. But but I was disappointed with the price. I actually thought, in my heart to hearts, we'd get, say, 40s. But clearly, the, the layers, uh, they, they know. Uh, 33s are exactly the same price I got on him two years ago when he'd already won the World Match Play and at Riviera. Mm. So that's a short price. I think, but 33 to 1, it's probably the right price. Yeah, and no, I think so. The, the, the stat that stuck out to me is his seventh place when he's at Colonial. He led the field that week for par 4 scoring, which is one of the key stats that you pulled out for this week, given it's a par 70, and you're going to need to score well in the par 4s this week to, to get into the I take you. I take it you've joined me on Bubba. You, you I, 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 there, was, there, was, there was no question. Was, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was backing Bubba this week regardless, I think. The other one I went with, and I was tempted on Dustin Rose. Uh, Dustin Rose. Oh. <laughs> I was tempted on Dustin Johnson. I've gone for Justin Rose. Because again, well. he, he played beautifully last week. He played really, really nicely. And... You know, my rolling numbers, and as you say, I do like a statistic, Barry, you know that. But I do keep a really close eye on these rolling strokes gain numbers now. 
And you take the last, since the resumption, so the last two outings, Justin Rose is fourth for strokes gained total. By the way, Barry, he's joint fourth with JT Poston. So you've got Bryson one, answer two with Michael Thompson, four JT Poston, Justin Rose and Justin Thomas. But also re, uh, Rose, he's third for strokes gained T to green behind DeChambeau and answer. And he's also uh, on approach play. Answer is one. Doc Redman is tied first. Justin Thomas at three. And we've got Justin Rose in the top 15. So he's just playing nice golf. And actually, you look at Rose, tends to get a lot of his wins up in the northeast of America, the northeastern mm-hmm. states, Ohio. Um, he's done well at Maryland around Washington. Clearly, he won at Marion, which is Maryland. Uh, or is that Connecticut? Oh, no, that's uh, that's Pennsylvania, again, northeast. So he just plays well around these parts. Massachusetts always plays well at Boston. It's it's his kind of grass setup. It's his kind of agronomy. So I just went rose, and he was he was only was it, I'd say what, a, a, what like an eighth of a cup away from making that playoff at Colonial the other week. Yeah, it just dived, didn't it? Literally, it was in, 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 and then yeah. at the ninety fifth percentile, dived to the left, and he thought he'd made it. He he thought he was in the playoff. He's that close from a playoff there, and I think Rose at that price, twenty eight to one. I think that's a fair price. He's got some very good scoring around here, and he's been a. I think he was a, been a thirty-six hole leader here uh, twice already. So he clearly gets on well with the course. And uh, as we're talking Ryder Cup, you know, there's a player that could actually put his hand up and show some. Uh, he needs to get some results, really, doesn't he? Because he, he started the year so poorly with the Honma clubs. He just needs to show to Harrington and the likes that you know I am the elite player that I used to be. And the, the switch to Taylor made is clearly the tee to green game is back. So, yeah, I, I plump for Rose. So I've gone Rose, Bubba, Abraham Anser and Victor Hovland. I've got two more that I've backed. So I've done DeChambeau, I've done Bubba. Um, you mentioned him earlier, uh, Sergio Garcia. Um, and I've backed him at 45s with eight places each way with William Hill. Um Impressed me last week after his opening round of 70 with three straight rounds of 65, finished fifth overall. The stat that really stuck out to me, that stood out to me, is 27 birdies on the week, which led the field. Um, so when Sergio's making lots of birdies, to be fair, he could have made 35. He missed another uh, eight, ten really good chances inside 15 feet I'd say during the course of the week and, you know he could have he could have won the tournament and uh, he could have made uh, made an absolute a huge number of birdies on the course of the week he's got to take a lot of um, heart into this week I think off the back of that performance talked about uh, Bubba's performance at uh, River, Riviera and um, clearly um, Riviera and, uh, and and this track are two that Bubba really gets on with uh, Sergio has got a decent record at Riviera as well. He's got four top six fin- or three top six finishes. Um, second here in 2014, he was shot behind uh, Kevin Streelman, and that was only because Streelman, as you remember, just went on a mad birdie barrage, didn't he? Birdied seven straight holes at the end, and to push Sergio down into second spot. So that to- is just brutal, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> What the hell? Like, what are you thinking when somebody does that to you? <laughs> just, it's not your day. No, you know, I just want to wrap the club around his neck and just keep squeezing. <laughs> yeah, you imagine if you'd have been, I, I wasn't on Strillman that week, but you'd imagine if you'd have been on him um, from a betting perspective and just seen him make birdie after birdie after birdie after birdie. He must have been virtually, he must have been out close to a thousand on Betfair Exchange, Strillman. Yeah. He's seven birdies yeah. to the last seven. Seven hours to go. Like, Away you go. That doesn't ha- that doesn't happen to normal punters that you just throw a few euro. <laughs> it on certainly never happened to me. I can assure you. <laughs> yeah. My my player would bogey the last seven. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Oh yeah. Dear. So um. So yeah. Hopefully a bit of redemption for Sergio this week. I thought forty five was was a was a, yeah. a fair price to take on this week. Um, one longer price is Tyler Duncan at 225 to 1. You can get on him right now with uh, seven places at Corals. So 
he's not the longest of hitters, is he, Tyler Duncan? So he's got a chance on these tracks, 6,800, as, as you said, this this week. He won the RSM Classic in November on a track that was um, just over 7,000 yards. So um, clearly quite comfortable in these shorter tracks. And went off the boil a bit, as they often do, these players, when they win a tournament like that. Um, but he's been flashing a bit of form since the restart on these shorter tracks. 38th at Colonial, we opened with a 65 that week. Uh, 28th at Hilton Head, his Friday round of 63 was one of the best rounds out there, actually. And seven of his eight rounds here on this track have been par or better. Um, he's finished 33rd on debut and 43rd last year. But on both of them, again, there's been some, some good... Um, interesting and exciting stats. Fourth for greens and regulation on debut, third for putting average on these greens last year. Um, final bit of justification with Tyler Duncan. His best putting performance of 2020 this year was at Riviera on the Ben, ben Power Greens. He was third for putting average. His best putting performance of last year came here. And again, he was third again clearly on the same greens as we're going to be playing this week. So he likes a bit of the bent power by all accounts. And so um, I think he's rounding into a little bit of under the radar form for a 200 to one shot. I had him in my um, DraftKings squad last week, Duncan. and he didn't disappoint 28. No, 6,500 yeah. this week on DraftKings. Yeah. yeah, probably a little bit chalkier this week based on his recent results. But yeah, Duncan's the kind of player that no one talks about. Mm. But he's playing good golf, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah I think it's his best ever season. Clearly, he's got his first win. He's going he's gonna to make the playoffs quite easily. So it, it's, a, it's a career season for Duncan so far. He's a decent player, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought he was worth taking a chance on it. Interestingly, so. on the Corn Ferry last two weeks, you had Luke List win, and then last week, Chris Kirk yeah, won. Yeah, Chris Kirk popped up, didn't he? Hmm. Two decent or oh, strong PGA Tour players there that have gone down a level and, and win the golf tournament. So, yeah, that was interesting on the Corn Ferry. Yeah, Any first that. round leader pumps? Uh, you know, I haven't looked in any great depth. The only one that really stands Someone out. Someone said to me on Twitter yesterday, and I'd never noticed this myself, he said, I looked at your analysis in your preview, Steve, and it all seems to be PM starters. Mm. PM starters dominate the first round leader. Board. Yeah, so it may be worth holding know. on to the uh, to the draw, which we'll get around about um, uh, tea time tonight over here in the, the UK. Mm. I think. And the only one that stands out is the one who sits right at the top of our stats page, which is Jordan Spieth, who's been the first round leader here a couple of times and also started fast the two times out since the restart, seventh and tenth after after the first round of his two starts. So. Um, Let's have a look and see what kind of tea time he gets and what kind of price we can get on Jordan. But um, that may be the way that I go with it this week. For those listeners that are still with us, I'll recap the, or I will go through the top 10 in the predictor model because I said I'm going to do it every week and I've forgotten this week. 10, Paul Casey. 9, Bryson. 8, Bubba. 7, Jason. Day. Eight, uh, 6, Rory. 5, Justin. 4, Brooks. 3, Webb. 2, Justin Thomas. Number 1, Dustin Johnson. Webb Simpson was the predictor number one last week and won the tournament. Yeah, he did, yeah. The signs were there. Yeah, they were. So the signs are there this week with Dustin Johnson, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else to say, gentlemen? No. Shall we I'll, call it? All good. Best of luck with your bets, guys. Let's hope one of us can get uh, get something in the mix this week. Be nice. It'd be very, very nice. Uh, we have the Detroit tournament next week and then two consecutive tournaments at Muirfield Village uh, the week, uh, the fortnight after that. So uh, we are slowly building towards that first major of the year at TPC Harding Park. Thank you, gentlemen. It's been a pleasure as always. Always good to have you on, Barry. And, um, Thanks, guys. We, we, the, the 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 listeners just love it when we see a, we see a doubling of download numbers when you're on, Barry. Oh, stop it. <laughs> that, that's, just, that's just your family. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll be back next week for the uh, Rocket Mortgage Classic. I can barely wait. I'll see you again soon. Goodbye.